I will start now. I'll show you the plans for this week, the assignments that you find, of course, in the lectures and readings page of the class wiki, which, in case you add it after the end of the first week, can be found if you type in your browser my first and last name, andreafedi.com slash CCS395, the code for this class. You will be redirected from there to the pages inside the servers of the app known as Notion, where you will find all the information you need about the class, including the syllabus, etc. After I show you the plans for the week, I will engage first in number two for today's plan, a summary of the first reading assignment, chapter one from a book, a short book called What is the History of Knowledge, which is one of the textbooks from this class. I will then show you my notes about what an epistemic engine is. If there is time, we will engage in a discussion about the university as an epistemic engine, what makes the university a knowledge-based institution that produces new knowledge in a more efficient way. So, as you see, this is the plan for Monday that I just explained. On Wednesday, I will continue with my demonstration of the app Notion. I will add information and show you on the screen how to do more formatting of the text, how to organize a page, how to add a link, an image, a video, embed a video in the page. And I will introduce the second way, the second option for the creation of a page in Notion, how to create a table, where table is an ambiguous term. A table is essentially a database of pages with tags can, that can be filtered out the same way that, in, in ways that a database can. Excuse me, hello? Ah, good morning, thank you. On Friday, we will experiment together in class, I will guide you to the creation of a, a different pages in Notion so that we have an opportunity to interact and I can support you, I can assist you. Ideally, I would like on Friday also to, for someone to come to the podium and show what they've done so far with their Notion pages and tell us about their experiences, their reaction to the app. The assignment that you find listed at the end of week two are really the first real assignment. In the categories apps, it says continue working on your Notion page, which means the deadline for sharing what you've created with me will come later. But my suggestion, my advice is continue with your work so that you can ask questions in class during the demonstrations, Wednesdays and Fridays, or come to my office in the library room and as in North 3004, or come on Zoom, schedule an appointment on Zoom, and I can assist you with that rather than waiting until the last hour to create your page in Notion. The chapter that I will introduce today is listed here under readings. Read it by next week or whenever you have time or even before. And the first written assignment, which is based on the discussion and the class activity with it, we did last Wednesday, is called My Digital Life. And you can refer to the instructions that I posted under week one, because that's essentially 
what you what you need to include in that assignment of about three to five hundred words. This is what I mean. If I scroll up, and go back to Wednesday of week one, I find this discussion, my digital life, the instructions that you find posted here, the instructions that I gave the class during this activity are your guidelines. And as I said in class, it might be that you don't have a lot to write about some of these points, or you have nothing to offer, no examples to offer, about one of these points, that's fine, because this must be adjusted to fit your own profile, and you only have between three and 500 words. So find the most interesting, the most pertinent, the most relevant way to go through these points and introduce elements in a narrative of your digital life, your digital lifestyle, your pa patterns of use. Yes, please. When you say things are due on a certain day, do you mean before 11.59? I'm sorry? Do you mean like before 11.59, so it's like due before Yeah. Okay. That would be the idea. Of course, it's very simple. If you find that this is not Blackboard that, or any other system, Google Forms, where past midnight, like Cinderella, everything disappears. Mm -hmm. So if you find that you need more time, just send me an email before the deadline, say, is it all right if I finish it by tomorrow night or by Wednesday? That's fine, we have an understanding. We're, we're colleagues, right? If you were working in an office, these things would happen all the time, that you miss a deadline. Just be professional about it. Just announce that you have a plan for completion of that assignment in a reasonable time. You get an extension and you get no penalty for lateness. Uh, it's convenient for me to have all of the assignments or most of the assignments by that date so that I can correct them as a batch. The way you share them though leaves you, lets you work on it even past the deadline because as you find here in the instructions at the end of week two, you create another notion page and there you place your reflections. Of course, you can write those reflections inside Notion. Otherwise, you can use another editor and then copy and paste those inside the Notion page. And of course, between now and the end of week three, February 11, when this is posted, when this is due, rather, if you need any help, you can ask questions in class, or you can come to the office, or you can schedule a Zoom appointment, okay? So we can be flexible, I can be flexible, but you need to be transparent, you need to um, have a plan, even if you're late. And of course, next to the title, week after week, I've placed A, if there is some work on an app, R, if there is a reading, W, if there is a written assignment, because some weeks are different, and that gives you a chance, even when you look at the table of contents, right? When you go up at the top of the page and look at the various weeks, you can see right away when there is a written assignment due, which means at the end, given, not due because this is given now and it is due at the end of this week, when there is a reading, when there is work about an app, or and none of, of those. Yes? When we like, create our uh, written assignment on our page, do we share like that same link, or is there a different link that we have to No, no, you share that via email, right? Although the system itself will announce it. And I'll show you, one of the things I'll show you during this week is how to share a page. And my idea, my preference would be that you make that, play, that, that page or any other page you create public. No one will find it. It will not be indexed by Google. 
unless you specify that in your setting. And if you make it public, we will have a chance to make these demonstrations more easily in class. However, it's not a requirement. You can very well keep it private, keep everything you create in Notion private, and just share that with me as another user using my Stony Brook email. Okay? But again, we have this week and next week to discuss the details. Okay? We have until February 11th when this is due. In the meantime, you can very well think of the contents, right? And write that reflection on your digital life. And then you can transfer that into Notion at a later time and format it, give it a title, etc., etc. Add an image if you want to, if you have a diagram that you created on a piece of paper and you want to take a picture on the phone, with the phone and add that image, you can be as creative as you want to. So let's, let's go back to week two. And to point number two, as you see here, you find a link of a page that I just created called excerpt from knowledges and their history. So that's where I'll go to continue with my lecture. Okay? And you see this is another page in Notion. And based on my own template, which can be modified, you can add as many properties as needed. In my case, the properties for this template are very simple. Created on, and I created this last night, past midnight. I did have problems with the storm. We did have frozen pipes and uh, no internet or spotty internet in the house. And of course, because we had frozen pipes and the heating system would not be working, we had to procure space heaters to save the house and get people to come and fix it, etc. So that's when I created this page. And that's when I finished it, 1.25 a.m. And I added tags, simple, the name of the author, work, and knowledge as one of the topics. Knowledges, because the idea is that we have a plurality of knowledges, and we talk in the plural in this field more often than not. History, because it's the history of knowledge. Excerpts, because this is what it is. And a catch-all tag. It's always nice to have a catch-all tag, and that is, of course, the code, the designator of the class. You find in here a table of content with all the sections and subsections, and at the end, the go-to, which is houses links to go to the reading page from there. So what I did in this case, I'm not going to do it for every single reading, but in the case of the first reading, being the first reading, chapter one of what is the history of knowledge by Peter Burke, being that chapter one is the introduction to the book. And chapter one contains some short and somewhat cryptic references to things that will be explained in chapter three or chapter four that we will read later on. I didn't want you to be confused. And I didn't want you to waste any time or any of your focus, attention on small details. For example, this chapter being the introduction includes a fair amount of names of scholars, intellectuals, philosophers. It includes a lot of titles. But the titles of those essays or books are not significant, are not fully relevant in the context of this class, with the exception of a few of them. And therefore, I decided late last night to go through the chapter myself, to extract from the chapter what I consider relevant for this class, which is only about 2,000 words. And I cut the text here and there. I added a few things. I organized it graphically 
in such a way that would make it easier for you to go through the reading. So I encourage you to read the whole chapter, but this is essentially what your focus should be on. And the purpose of this, the first part of this class, is to go through as much as I can of this and stop and focus on some points, add a few examples, clarifications, give you now a chance to ask questions, okay? But this would be like the study guide. I included a few links if you want to know more about the people who are mentioned in here. Just a few pictures, a few call outs, etc. Some bold formatting where things were more important, okay? And it is essentially some key ideas from this book, from the first chapter, and more importantly, some key terms that I want you, but of all the terms and the terminology that you find in the chapter, I included here just a selection of those key terms and their definitions that will actually be used in, in this class and therefore something that you have to become familiar with, okay? So the first section of this page is also, of course, I follow the order of the topics in the chapter. It's also the first page in the chapter of the textbook. It tells you something simple enough to understand, that before we delve into the intricacies of the history of knowledge, it's easy when you reflect on those terms, history and knowledge, it's easy to realize that in the history of humankind, there are moments in which there have been changes, especially in the fields of technology, in different fields of technology, changes that affected the way knowledge was produced, stored, accessed, retrieved, organized, and anyone, even without a specific expertise in the field of the history of knowledge, can list or agree with this uh, series of changes brought by by new technologies that you find in here. So the invention of the alphabet and the invention of written languages affected knowledges around the world in a major way. And that, of course, we don't go into the particulars, different areas of the world, different ethnic groups got a elaborated, created a written language at different times, in different forms, etc. But we agree that the written language was a major change in the history of knowledge. The same way the invention of printing affected knowledge in a major way. And for the invention of printing, of course, we have to keep in mind the first form of this technology, which was created in China with printing blocks. And then the, we can define it, the industrial version of this technology, which is the invention of the printing press in Germany by Gutenberg around 1430s. And moving on, it's easy to jump from there to the idea that digital technologies, such as computers that were introduced during the 1940s and later, and especially the personal computers introduced during the early 1980s, and then uh, later on, the creation of the World Wide Web, World Wide Web, the internet, provoked a major change in the handling of knowledge. And the biggest change of all was that with the internet, knowledge itself became a product, but not single 
areas of knowledge or specific collections of contents and data, but the totality of knowledge became a marketable product. And based on that, Google, based on the assumption that Google can offer you something approaching the totality of knowledge, Google DB became one of the largest companies in the world. And that's how we associate Google with the idea of the knowledge industry, and in some ways, the knowledge-based economy. And of course, when you talk about Google, don't forget YouTube also, which claims to offer you the totality or something approaching to the totality of videos shared and uh, other formats such as, for example, Wikipedia, which does the same in the field of encyclopedias, which was a new genre of book, books that developed from the late Renaissance and uh, had the best uh, expressions during the age of the Enlightenment, especially the French encyclopedia. Feel free to interrupt me with questions or comments at any time. So among the names that we want to remember, of all the names that you find in chapter one, one that is significant enough is the name of Francis Bacon, who was an aristocrat, a high-ranking administrator in England around the age of Shakespeare, end of the 16th century, beginning of the 17th century, died in 1626, I believe. And he was committed to develop knowledge, as it happened in other areas, in other parts of Europe, in support of the good administration of the state. He had an understanding that the administration of a society, from the government and going top down, of course, in this kind of society, had a lot to do with knowledge. That knowledge was one of the pillars of power of the government and more importantly of the administration of the state. But if it is so, if you want to grow, develop, expand the power in a society and the power available to his government, then you need to work on education. And by the way, keep in mind that this man you see here is considered one of the pioneers together with Galileo Galilei in Italy and Isaac Newton in England of the modern scientific method. But in here, we're not interested in his understanding of the scientific process. We're interested in his idea of using knowledge to grow power and efficiency in a society. And what he called the reform of knowledge was really a grandiose and ambitious education plan. And these are the points that we want to focus on. That in order to reform knowledge, you need to work on education. And in order to perfect education, you need to understand the process of learning. And how do you do that? He had a kind of big data version of the time, a kind of big data approach to it. That is to say, we cannot enact a reform of knowledge without reforming the way people are being educated. And in order to bring improvements in those areas, we need to know, we need to explore, we need to observe and gather data about what is studied when and where in various communities in England, in Europe, in other parts of the world. How knowledge travels from one country to another. The 1500s were the, really the, the, the start of globalization. And by globalization, at that point, I mean that a piece of information that comes to Europe, to England, or to Italy, from China, from Indonesia, can affect the price of products in those markets. 
And that is the first manifestation of globalization, the first understanding that all the areas of the world are in some ways, for example, economically and politically interconnected. And therefore, gathering knowledge gives you more power, whether it be the power to control the market, the prices, the sale and distribution of products, or in, in, in the political field, the way you proceed with plans of expansion, colonialism, nationalism, imperialism. So besides knowing how knowledge travels, is distributed, is communicated, he thought it was necessary to know how culture, how knowledge flourished, decayed, or was lost. And that is a biological model. You understand right away that beyond, behind these terms, you have the biological model of plants and animals, birth, growth, development, matur maturity, decay, decline, and death. And that was the most common model during the 1500s applied, the most common knowledge model applied to the understanding of anything from society, politics, literature, and learning itself, okay? And then you find, as the last point, the diverse administrations and managing of, of learning, not only in Europe, but throughout the world. That is to say, if we want to reform knowledge and education, we need first to gather data about how education is organized, not just in England, not just in Europe, but all over the world, and you get this idea of a global repository of knowledge, of a globalized knowledge that is very interesting, very modern. And I added this section as just a passing reminder. The book has more to say, but we're not interested in the particular. But based on that, later on, you find the Historia Literaria developed by German scholars, which is not the history of literature, but the history of humane literate, litera, that is to say humanities, of education, the history of what are the contents of an education in the humanities throughout times and in different society, societies. From the time of Bacon, you can move on to the 19th century where the prevailing models come from some of the sciences. For example, from geology, and you have here the example of Lyell's Elements of Geology, where you find the modern approach to ge geology, the idea of strata, the idea of layers, the idea that you dig or open a rock and you find different layers that bring you back, show you the history of that rock, the history of that terrain, and the changes that occurred that affected the materials that you are examining and of course, also down below, you find a reference to Charles Darwin's Origins of the Species about 20 years later, 1858, where you still find this idea of a model where development, change, and evolution are the dominant modalities in nature, and therefore, they can be applied also to knowledge and to the study of the history of knowledge. And of course, there is a connection that is implied in the book by Peter Burke that I want to make more explicit, that I'm trying to make more explicit by making this a sub-point to this. That is to say, what is the working model in Darwin? It's the ecosystem. It's the natural context. What is that? produces changes in a species, is their interaction with their surroundings. The conditions, the circumstances, the climate, the terrain in which they find themselves, as well as other animals or humans in that environment affect those changes. And this is, in a completely different field, the same kind of intellectual model that you find in the theories of Karl Marx, 
the theories of Marxism and communism, where human society is analyzed, discussed, and plans for reform are envisioned based on the assumption that the social context, the socioeconomic context of a single individual in society is affected by their social surroundings, especially by who controls the means of production, and therefore also by the social standing, the social placement of an individual in a class. But even though we're talking about two completely different theories and set of theories, you can see the commonalities. You can see that you basically have the same working model in both, the same kind of approach from the point of view of knowledge. And that's the kind of connections that we want to develop. And that's why we don't want to be lost in details. We don't, know, we don't need to know too much about Marxism, even though I can answer questions or try to answer questions. I'm not a, primarily an expert on this or Darwin, even though I, I did a course on Darwin at the University of Florence about Darwin and the philosophy of, uh, 19, of the 19th century. But this is the kind of connections we want to develop, OK? See patterns in the history of knowledge. From that section, it is easy to jump to this section, and, and again, I've skipped here and there paragraphs moving from one section to another exactly so that you can focus with me on the essentials. But you can see the continuums, the development of the same kind of thinking when you go from there to this field called the sociology of knowledge, which was developed by German scholars. You don't have to, to know the German terminology. Just included a few terms here and there. But, and the focus of this discipline is who knows what, the use of different kinds of knowledge in different societies in the past as well as in the present. And in particular, within the history of knowledge, those who focused on the history of the natural sciences became the model for other kinds of history, the history of the social human sciences, the history of the humanities, or the history of knowledge in general. They took their inspiration from the ideas of and the approaches of those sociologists. And that's enough to know for now, as well as in a few lines, we can just have this idea in mind that history of knowledge has developed during the last 50 to 100 years to the point where we have a whole discipline, a whole area devoted to just the history of the book, of the printed book. How books were made, who made them, what was the culture of the printers, of the publishers, of the editors, how were the books packaged in order to share distribute knowledge, and in order to make that knowledge more accessible, easier to retrieve, easier to reorganize. Of course, when you study knowledge in general with a globalized approach, then you find that it may be somewhat difficult to define knowledge or even to define science. And these are very important points that I hope, in their brevity, cutting out everything else, are easy enough to understand. That when you approach the study of the history of knowledge and the history of science in particular, one of the problems is that science is a rather modern concept. There is no modern science before Galilei, but even Galilei had a limited understanding of modern science. In fact, Galilei was basically an Aristotelian. He was a university professor teaching classes based on Aristotle's logic. He applied 
to the study of astronomy, to the study of the planets and of other celestial bodies, the logic of Aristotle. That's how he would discuss in class and in his essays things such as the spots on the sun or the trajectories of bodies orbiting around the planets. Okay? So, science as we understand it today was processed in a more contemporary fashion through the second half of the 19th century and the 20th century itself, right? We can still talk about Newton, right? Newton went out, he examined a tree, he observed a tree, he saw that apples were falling from the tree, right? And then he said, why are apples falling from this tree? And he came up with the idea of gravity, right? But we can still talk about gravity, but is it how we explain this phenomenon these days? Are apples falling down because they're attracted by the mass of the Earth? No, that's not the scientific ex explanation anymore. Now we're talking about the, the energy and space continuum using Einstein and how it changes around things, right? And we're moving past, we're already moving past that idea of explaining uh, the, the, the physics of objects moving in space. So how can you go back in time and examine the history of science is if, if what you're studying with the Greek philosophers of nature, with the empirical philosophers of the classical era, or with the alchemists, is not exactly science, right? You have a problem that is correctly defined as anachronis anachronism, because you you are just opposing, you're imposing your modern view of the world to something that is vastly different. And therefore, you're distorting your analysis of a past that is not completely scientific. The second issue is that there is knowledge even in the material world. Even artisans possess and develop and produce material knowledge. Or healers in a tribal setting, in a pre-scientific or non-scientific, non-medical setting. So how can you, with a globalized approach, exclude those just by saying, it's not knowledge, it's not science? And finally, you have the issue of addressing knowledge in non-Western cultures. Can you simply discard and say anything that is not scientific according to Western canons and principles is not relevant, and therefore you see the complexity of trying to map the history of knowledge. The epistemological term means simply that at some point, everyone, every, almost every field, every discipline was also or primarily concerned with what knowledge is. And you find some details in here, but the important part of this paragraph of this section, rather, is what is knowledge, what is information, what are other forms of knowledge, such as what we might refer to as wisdom. And I kept from the book just the simplest examples. Some of them are very common sense. Just to further your reflection, our communal reflection on this. So in the US, at some point during the 20th century, 1960s, 70s, 80s, there was a lot of talk about information rather than knowledge. And the following are the statements that Burke is using to expand the discussion. The idea that you hear oftentimes we are drowning in information. There's a cloud. There is a an overwhelming amount of information that comes our way from our digital devices, from different agencies, the government, sub-agencies of the government, etc. 
just think of COVID, the schools, universities, etc. But we have so much information, but we are starved of knowledge. That is to say, we know, but do we know what we know? Do we know things at a higher level? And Burke is mentioning a poet, an intellectual of the 20th century, Eliot, who put this in this formula, but of course the formula itself is not completely original. Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? And it's sufficient for us to have this idea that you have, at the basis of the pyramid, basic information. That would be big data. A step above that, you would have knowledge. That is what we extract from the data. And that one step above, we have wisdom, which would be the big ideas that drive the processes of extraction of knowledge. It's also interesting and easy to understand the metaphor uh, introduced by French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss, who says, information is like raw food, and knowledge is like cooked food. That is to say, there is a process that has been applied to go from raw bits of data to the level that we call knowledge. So the process will drive, the kind of process you apply will drive the kind of product you prepare and serve. Which is also why it is just an illusion that Google is able to offer you something approaching the totality of knowledge, right? Just think of a practical example. Can you diagnose yourself with something, whether it be COVID or anything else, using Google and typing in your symptoms? Can you? Have you ever tried? Most people do, right? What is the conclusion? When you see, oh, I'm experiencing these symptoms. I don't know what it is, but uh, loss of appetite, I'm coughing, sometimes I feel fatigued at night, etc or whatever you want to make your list of symptoms. What is the end result? What happens at the end of your search? You go on and you search, you search. Google is giving you, it's feeding you with information based on your input. What happens at the end? Do you reach a diagnosis? What is the result? What is the outcome? If you've tried, what, what happens at the end? Are you reassured? Or, or do you know what you have or? Self-diagnosis. Self-diagnosing yourself. Are you? Are you reassured? Are you certain of what you have in most instances? Um, in most cases, I would say no, just because I, because you lack the expertise that most like medical professionals have. Right. And that expertise applies to what part of this? For example, for Claude Levy's source. Knowledge. Is the cooking? Yeah, the cooking. Right? It's the process. Yeah, the process. Sorry. So you may have all the information, all the raw information you, you want, but the end result, you don't want to admit it to my face, but the end result is most people will come out of this search thinking, oh my God, I may have any of these 10 terrible diseases. For sure, I'm going to die or remain disabled or have a chronic condition, but you know less you know less. You've acquired information, but you know less about your condition than when you started. You just have more reasons to worry because you find that your symptoms, whether it be 3, 10, 15, 2, your symptoms apply to any number of diseases that you never knew about. But you don't know which one. And you don't know which one because you need a medical profession to do the cooking for you and to serve you the finished this, right? So Google is marketing hype. You assume that you will find what you need to know on Google, but it's mostly information and very little knowledge, unless you are a professional, and then you know how to treat data. And the, the next part tells you that information and data itself is never easy to recognize, identify, or produce. Because 
we think information is basic, so there is no disagreement. But even data is never produced objectively. There is always a process of gathering and organizing data that affects what data is offered to the user. What is data and how it is organized in the presentation. So even before any knowledge is extracted, some knowledge is infused into the process of <coughs> producing what we think are the foundational elements of a knowledge-based process, okay? And that process, classification, analysis, verification, measure, etc., is what we will focus on with later chapters of this particular book. Of course, this section is here to remind you that it's easy to assume that there is an objective knowledge and that should be what we call, what we define science, and there is a personal or subjective knowledge. But how do you address the context of believers in a religious belief? Because from the outside, you can call their beliefs personal subjective knowledge, but from the inside of a community, even a large community, that is considered to be knowledge, established and agreed on knowledge. Or if you're a historian, you cannot discard anything that doesn't match the modern standards of knowledge. Because if you study the past, then you need to focus, document, analyze what the people from a society from the past or single individual assumed to be knowledge. So it's an indirect kind of object objectivity. And of course, this entire section is simply to tell you that we don't talk about knowledge in general. For the past 30 or 40 years, we've been talking about knowledges in various languages. And there are various examples, not that you have to remember the names, but you might have encountered, especially the name of Michel Foucault. Uh, just to put some faces behind this, and you find a list here of different kinds of knowledge, right? To justify that it's a plurality of knowledges that we refer to. And I'll, I'll just move on, but focus on, for example, the basic distinction of knowing why or what, which was the focus of the past, of intellectuals and philosophers, and then proto-scientists of the past, to knowing how. So a modern scientist doesn't really ask, tries to answer the question, why does the world exist? Although you can, right? Because what laws justify the existence of the world? But that's more how, how the world came up, came out, the universe <coughs> came out, than the why. And there is always something that is just assumed to be true. It just changes, right? People in, from the past, or some people in the present, assume that the Trinity is, is a given. Uh, pillar of, of knowledge that you can apply to your life or the existence of witchcraft or for, for most people today the fact that the earth is round and you can tell me yes but that's scientific have you verified that have you read any articles no you just assume it to be true because your high school professors your university professors and everyone else uh, told you so right so if you were to engage now in a debate with one of those uh, YouTubers who uh, um, proposed the theory of a flat Earth, you are right, they're wrong, but would you be able to argue the case? Probably not, because it's just something we assume to be true. We don't concern ourselves with the reasons, with the demonstrations, with the examples. You may have studied it in primary school or middle school, and maybe you've forgotten or you'll forget by the, the time you're 30 or 35. Same with the sources of truth. What is that makes something true? In the past was often oral testimony. You read the gospels, and what is the principle of truth in there? Why are you supposed to believe that Jesus was God, was the son of God? Simply because the gospels place next to Jesus the apostles. 
you find the apostles in those stories so that you as the reader from those times second century the, the gospels were written only at the end of the first century or now the reader can just think I know this is true because some people were with Jesus when he died or when he resurrected or when he did the miracles and therefore their testimony was passed on to other believers who told this story to other believers and eventually it was written down in the Gospels. Okay, so oral testimony is the foundation of the value of the Gospels, for example. And that is true of so many books from antiquity. Later on, it is only around the year 50, the 16th century, the 1500s, that documents become a kind of evidence. More important, considered more objective than oral testimony. Up until that point, not so much, okay? Even though it's hard for us to conceive. If you read a book written by Roman historians about the Roman emperors, or about Julius Caesar, or about other heroes and leaders of the Roman era, what is one thing that you find constantly in those books? I don't know if you've read any in translation or if you've taken Latin, any of you, can anyone try to answer briefly? I, I'm not, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you want to contribute, what is one thing that you find constantly that you wouldn't find in a history book today, of today? You find speeches. You find Julius Caesar. You find Emperor Nero. You find another Roman hero. All of a sudden, before a battle, during the battle while they're about to die, like in movies, from the 1940s and 50s, all of a sudden, they talk. They talk to the soldiers, they talk to the courtesans, they talk to their, friend, to their friends and collaborators, and they explain things. Why so many speeches? Because oral testimony was supposed to be the foundation of the truth for those history books. So you cannot simply say Julius Caesar, before crossing the Rubicon and conquering and moving towards Rome to conquer the city, had this plan, had this idea. No, you cannot. Where is the proof of that? So you have Julius Caesar stop in front of the Rubicon, gathering the people around him and say, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go to march on Rome. We're going to bring down the Republic of Rome and replace it with a better government, etc., etc. Because this way, you as the reader, you can go by the assumption that this is true because some people heard Julius Caesar talk and explain his plan. And then those people told other people who told other people who told someone who eventually wrote it down. Okay? So that is the principle of validity for centuries and centuries of culture, especially historical culture, but even religious culture altogether, right? That's why you have the visions. Why would Christianity be associated with constant visions, right? You have children in, in Fatima at the beginning of the 20th century seeing the Virgin. You have people in Medjugorje, in the former Yugoslavia, in the 1980s and up until now, seeing the Virgin and receiving messages. Why? Because again, you need this, this connection. I can prove this is true because the Virgin, because God, because the, the, the Holy Ghost told me. And therefore, mine is not just the truth, it's a testimony. I can testify that this I saw this, I heard, etc. Okay, let me add just a couple of minutes and then we'll bring this to an end and continue at some other time. Um, let me move this. These are some of the terms since we are talking about knowledge and information. Well, these things have already been developed by the philosophy of the, of the past in a very refined way. It, it's not just about Google. So the system of the Greeks in Greek language had these five levels of knowledge, which you should keep in mind because we'll refer to especially some of them. One is techne, which is the basis for the word technique and technology. Techne is knowing how to do something. But it's not just practical. It can be anything, knowing how to talk. And that would be rhetoric. Knowing how to write. And that would be another branch of rhetoric. Style, stylistics. Then there is episteme, 
which you find in the word epistemology, which is knowledge in general. You have practical, experiential knowledge, and that was called praxis, which you find in the word pragmatic. There was phronesis, which was prudence or wisdom. That is to say, I have all this information, all these experiences, all this education. What have I learned that can modify the direction of my life? That can make you prudent, meaning I can avoid pitfalls, failures, and acquire wisdom to generate success. And then there is gnosis, which is insight, the knowledge of your deeper self, which reflects what was written on a temple in Delphi, ancient Greece, Nopi Seoton, know yourself, meaning develop an, an internal focus, really understand what is the essence of your individuality, of your personality. I'll stop here, and you can continue also at home, right?